welcome to episode number 219 of CXO Talk. I'm Michael Krigsman, an industry analyst and your host. Today we have a, such an interesting show. We're going to be talking about data and automation and machines and machine learning and AI and the role of all of this in business today and what it means for the future. Our guests are uh, David Bray, who is, well, David has been on the show a number of times. And David, why don't you introduce yourself? I am David Bray. Uh, I refer to myself as digital diplomat and human flag jacket, otherwise known as chief information officer at the Federal Communications Commission. Uh, also mentioned that I'm an Eisenhower fellow to Australia and Taiwan, which means I met with their government and industry leaders in both countries about what their plans are for the Internet of Things. And then briefly just mentioned how 10 years ago, I actually met Michael Chu at the Oxford Internet Institute, and we were actually working together on how one could best do what was called distributed problem solving. How can you bring human and technology nodes to reach better outcomes in organizations? And so that's why it's so great to be here with Michael again, talking about artificial intelligence. Fantastic. and. I met Michael Chu, who is with the McKinsey Global Institute, uh, through David. And just after we arranged for Michael to be on this show, I saw him on CNBC in such a, the most interesting segment. So Michael Chu, welcome to CXO Talk. And please tell us briefly about yourself and uh, what do you do at McKinsey? Sure, delighted to. Um, like David, I was once a, a CIO of a public sector organization, but it was much smaller. It was a municipality. Uh, but now that I'm a partner in the McKinsey Global Institute, I lead some of our firm's research. Uh, it's part of the, the larger McKinsey and Company um, management consulting firm. I lead some of our research on the impact of long-term technology trends. And they were including uh, you know, some of the distributed uh, problem solving that David mentioned, but also artificial intelligence, uh, robotics, uh, and AI. So, Michael, you have been studying data analytics. Uh, you came out with a, a very rich report, a lengthy and deep and interesting report last December. And so please share with us your view on data and digital disruption. Well, and one of the things that uh, we've been studying for quite some time uh, is the, the potential impact of using data and analytics uh, to change organizations, as you said, as you said for instance, uh, disrupting um, either industries or organizations. Uh, our first publication was actually five years ago, um, uh, this uh, report on big data. And to a certain extent, this uh, report that we published in December is, is a sequel. Uh, it's, a, it's a good thing in movies. Sometimes it's a good thing in research, too. One of the things we identified back in 2011 was the tremendous potential of using data and analytics uh, to really change the game. And we looked at uh, the public sector in Europe, we looked at healthcare in the United States, we looked at manufacturing, retail, uh, location-based services, and said, in each of these domains, if you use data and analytics, either as a basis of competition or as a way to increase the efficiency or effectiveness of what you're doing or change business models, we saw the potential for all kinds of good things to happen, both for the organizations themselves, whether or not it's a a retailer trying to sell more, uh, but also a, a healthcare provider trying to improve the healthcare outcomes of a, a country or an organization, et cetera. We saw all kinds of potential, and we said that could potentially happen within 10 years. And so five years on, we said, well, let's see how things are going. Let's see how much value has been captured out of the billions of dollars of potential value. And by the way, that's not just profits, that's uh, improved healthcare outcomes, uh, that's uh, better services provided to citizens, et cetera. And quite frankly, what we found in this uh, last piece of research, amongst the many findings that we discovered, when we, we had that sort of look into the rear view mirror, we said it, the, the report card's actually quite mixed. Some organizations have really extended their ability to use data and analytics, and some sectors have moved farther than others. And to be frank, those are sectors in which you had, uh, in many cases, a digital native competitor you had to compete against. So retailers had moved along farther. Um, there are other sectors and organizations which, quite frankly, have been, on average, farther behind, capturing only about 10 to 30 percent of the potential value. Unfortunately, some of those have been public sector. Uh, but again, there's great individual variation. The other thing we found is the spread in performance between not only sectors, but individual organizations. And I know David's been doing terrific things at the U.S. Uh, uh, FCC. 
And again, uh, some of the organizations that have been doing the most have really extended their lead versus median or even lagging organizations. So David, the uh, your view is a public policy view, especially when you wear your Eisenhower fellow hat. So any thoughts on this from a public perspective? So uh, I agree uh, 100% with what Michael said, that different sectors are embracing the opportunity provided by data analytics, artificial intelligence, um, and that it does seem to be for those sectors where there is a digital native incumbent or so an organization that is either a startup or already present that has embraced uh, the digital regime that pressures the rest of those organizations to move along. Uh, public sector, on the other hand, you have the challenges of not just the United States, but around the world, governments are facing pressures of to do more with less. Uh, here in the United States, we had sequestration, but also talking to Australia, when I met with them, their public sector leaders were facing that they might be having a recession. Uh, in Taiwan, the economy was sort of not growing as fast as it had previously. And so here you have shrinking budgets, yet at the same time, you're being asked to uh, sort of transform how you do your work. And so it's a challenge of how do you leapfrog from legacy investments in IT, you can't be a startup because you have to keep things running and you have to keep on serving the public. But at the same time, if you keep on doing things on premise with legacy IT that's on average five to 10 years old, you won't be able to get where you need to go. And so at the FCC, when I arrived three years ago, um, it was an interesting situation where there had been nine CIOs in eight years, which I always say was a great sign for CIO number 10 that things are just going great. Um, and I quickly surveyed that they had more than 207 different IT systems that were on average more than 10 years old. We even had some that were approaching 19 or 20 years of age. And they were consuming more than 85% of our budget just to maintain those systems. And so, that's where I said in two years or less, it was at the time it was a rather ambitious and I think I had a lot of people that were a little surprised, in two years or less, we wanna have nothing on premise at the FCC. We wanna go straight to either public cloud or commercial service provider because you cannot capture the benefits of data analytics, artificial intelligence, the internet of things and making sense of the data that's coming from them if you are still tied to legacy IT. And the good news is two years later, so we did it. We reduced our spend from being 85% to 50%. But in a lot of ways, that was just setting the scene for getting ready for making sense of all these widespread data sources, making sense of what can be brought in from machine learning and AI. So Michael, uh, how do organizations make the decision to invest and where should they invest? And how does AI and machine learning come into play? in a practical sense, as opposed to all the media hype that were either media hype or science fiction? How do we how do we become practical about it? Well, a few things. I think one of the things that's happened over the years that um, you know we've been doing research on it, as well as more and more organizations have started to understand the potential data analytics and then those applications to these techniques, AI and machine learning, uh, is that awareness has certainly grown um, that in fact, um, amongst, let's call it executives, uh, whether they be public sector, public sector or private sector executives, have started to understand that in fact, data and analytics is becoming either a basis of competition or a basis of providing the services uh, and products um, that your customers, your citizens, your stakeholders need. So at least we've reached that level of, aware of awareness. Uh, but as David and I have talked about, now this spread in terms of actually what has been able to be captured uh, what sorts of value has actually been able to be generated um, comes about for a number of reasons. And I think as we've looked at organizations all around the world, if you ask an executive there, you ask a leader there, um, you know, are you thinking about data? Are you thinking about analytics? Uh, and are you doing anything? And almost everyone says yes. Um, and many would say, oh, we've got a very successful pilot. We conducted this experiment. Very, you know, we've invested in the technology. We've invested in you know, hiring some data scientists or analysts, et cetera, software, hardware, uh, you know, on cloud or on-prem or, or what have you, we're doing that transition. But I, I, w what we found oftentimes, while there are oftentimes, you know, real uh, technology challenges, which take real investment and time and energy, uh, and, you know, as a technologist myself, I mean, it's very interesting to talk about those things. Oftentimes what we find, the real barrier is 
uh, is around the people stuff. Uh, it is how do you get from an interesting experiment where there's a business relevant insight. Um, you know, we could increase the uh, conversion rate uh, by X percentage if we actually uh, use this next product to buy algorithm in this data. We could reduce the maintenance costs or increase the uptime of this capital good. Uh, we could in fact, you know, bring more people into this uh, public service because we can identify them better. But getting from that insight to really capturing value at scale is where we start to find oftentimes organizations um, either stuck or falling down. And it really has to do with how do you embed that interesting insight, that you know that thing that you can capture, if you, whether it's you know from a some sort of machine learning algorithm, whether it's uh, you know other types of analytics, into the practices and processes of an organization, so it really changes uh you know the, the way things operate at scale right you know to use a military metaphor how how do you how do you how do you steer that aircraft carrier um you know and, and you know it's true freight ships as it, as it is for military ships they are hard things to turn and that organizational challenge of understanding the mindsets having the right talent in place and then really changing the practices at scale i think that's where we're seeing a big difference between those organizations who have just you know, reached awareness and maybe done something interesting to ones who have radically changed their performance in a positive way through data and analytics and AI. I want to uh, remind everybody that you're watching CXO Talk. And right now is a there is a tweet chat that is taking place on Twitter, of course, using the hashtag CXO Talk. And you can ask questions of our guests directly and they will answer. So, <laughs> and we're talking, <laughs> well, we hope they'll answer. Uh, so uh, David Bray, uh, Michael Chewy was saying, uh, Michael Chu, I'm sorry, was saying uh, that the barrier to adoption is the people. Now, in the realm of AI and machine learning, how does this particular issue play out? Is there anything that's unique about AI machine learning that uh, that we need to be considering when we talk about adoption and the proliferation of these technologies in the enterprise in a meaningful way? So that's a really great question. I, first, I would say is I, 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 I emphatically agree with what Michael was saying that the the real secret to success is changing what people do in an organization. That you can't just roll out technology and say, we've gone digital, but we didn't change any of our business processes and expect to actually have great outcomes. And I have similarly seen both in the private sector and in the public sector here in the United States, here in the federal government, but also in other countries like Australia, Taiwan, and other places in Europe, where they'll do experiments that are isolated from the rest of public service. And they say, well, look, see, we're doing these experiments over here, but they're never translating <clears throat> to changing how you do the actually at scale, the business of public service. And to do that requires not technology, but understanding the narrative of how the current processes work, why they're being done that way in an organization, and then what is the 2B state, and how are you gonna be that leader that shepherds the change from the as is to the 2B state. And I think for public service, we're really lacking right now conversations about how we could dramatically deliver results differently and better to the public. Now, for artificial intelligence, in some respects, it's just a continuation of predictive analytics, a continuation of big data. It, it really is nothing new in terms of the fact that technology always changes the art of the possible. This is just a new art of the possible. I do think there's an interesting thing in which it could offer a reflection of our own biases through artificial intelligence. If we're not careful, we'll roll out artificial intelligence populating with data from humans that we know humans are biases and biased and we'll find out that the artificial intelligence itself, the machine learning is biased. Now at the same time, we could actually use it to say, look for biases in past outcomes, past decisions, past performance with this organization and let us know where things weren't exactly as either equitable or as beneficial as they could be. So AI could either A, be a dangerous tool where it just reflects and augments and amplifies human biases, or it gives us a chance to look in the mirror and say, did you know you're being biased when you make these decisions or these outcomes? And I think that's a little bit more unique than say predictive analytics by itself or big data. 
Michael, let's drill down now into AI a little bit more deeply and machine learning. In your research, what are some of the business areas that are today most well suited and where do you see this going? So we did do some research in terms of trying to understand uh, where there's the greatest potential from some of these technologies. I think one of the interesting things that we discovered was, um, well, first of all, our, our hypothesis was, uh, as we looked across about 10 different industry sectors and a, a dozen different um, uh, uh, types of problems in each, we expected, quite frankly, that uh, much as we find for other techniques, that most of the value would be concentrated, 80% of the value coming from 20% of the problems or something along those lines. Uh, when we surveyed about 600 different industry experts, every single one of those problems we identified, at least one expert suggested was one of the top three uh, problems that, that machine learning could actually uh, help improve. And so what that actually says is that the, the scope for potential is just absolutely huge. There's almost no problem uh, where AI machine learning potentially couldn't in fact improve uh, performance. That being said, well, uh, a few things uh, that come to, to, to mind. One is a lot of the most interesting and recent research has been in this field called deep learning. And that, that's particularly suited for certain types of problems with pattern recognition, oftentimes image, images, et cetera. And so those problems that are somewhat similar to, to image recognition, pattern recognition, et cetera, are some of those that are uh, quite amenable and quite interesting. So again, in terms of a very specific types of uh, problems, uh, predictive maintenance is a huge one. Um, the ability to keep something from breaking. Uh, so, you know, rather than waiting until it breaks and then fixing it, uh, the ability to pr predict when something's gonna break, not only because it reduces the cost, because it's cheaper, in fact, to do predictive, to, you know, try to keep something from breaking then rather than, than uh, paying someone to fix it. The more important thing is the thing doesn't go down, right? So if you bring down a, a, a part of a, an assembly line, you bring down the entire factory oftentimes, or at least the entire line. Um, and so being able to avoid that cost, uh, same, same kind of thing on a, um, a jet engine, on a wing of an airplane, et cetera. And so it, to a certain extent, that is a, 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 uh, an example of pattern matching. When you have all of these sensors, which are the signals that actually reflect that something's going to break and you should go and, and do some predictive maintenance. And so we find that across a huge number of different industries that have these capital assets, whether it's a generator, a building, uh, an HVAC system, a vehicle, where if you're able to predict ahead of time before something's going to break, that you should actually conduct some maintenance. Um, that is one of the areas in which uh, machine learning uh, can be quite powerful. But the other thing is, again, taking this idea that if you have one problem in one area and you look for analogous problems, if you take healthcare as another case of predictive maintenance on the human capital asset, um, then you can start to think, well, gosh, if I have the Internet of Things, if I have sensors on, uh, on a patient's body, can I tell before they're going to have a, a, you know, a, a cardiac incident? Can I tell before someone's going to have a diabetic incident that, in fact, they should take some action which could be relatively um, uh, less expensive and relatively less invasive than having that turn into an emergent case where they have to go into a very expensive, very painful uh, and very urgent uh, care type of situation. Again, can you use machine learning to be able to do prediction? Uh, those are some of the things that we're starting to see in terms of problems uh, that can be uh, potentially better solved by using AI and machine learning. David, um, a practical question from you, and then we have uh, a few questions from Twitter. So as a CIO, how much are you thinking about AI, machine learning, and predictive analytics in the operations of your organization? So right now, I actually have a ask out to all the 18 different bureaus and offices of the Federal Communications Commission to identify a bureau or office challenge or problem involving the public that they would like to have machine learning and artificial intelligence brought to bear. Um, woe be it to the CIO that tries to force a solution onto a bureau or office that's not ready for it yet. And so this is trying to see if they are receptive, if they can spot something. 
I mean, maybe it is identifying where we can provide, as, as Michael mentioned, uh, preventative maintenance of services um, that can actually benefit the organization and benefit the public. Maybe it's making sense of comments that we receive. Uh, we did actually, <clears throat> back in 2014, we did make public comments we received on a specific issue that involved 4 million comments with the idea that actually we wanted to allow the public to use tools to bear to make sense of them. Sentiment analysis, understanding what was either a for or against proposition. And I think in some respects, public service has the opportunity that it's not necessarily in competition with any organization. We could actually make our data available, recognizing we need to protect privacy, but once we protect privacy, make that data available and allow the private sector and the public sector to make sense of it, we don't have to do it by ourselves. And so I think the opportunity for artificial intelligence and machine learning is, what are those things, it's a little bit harder at the national level, that will benefit the public. I think a lot of things are going to happen first in cities. I mean, we've heard talk about smart cities. There you can easily see where if you could actually have preventative maintenance on a road or better providing a power and actually monitoring it to avoid brownouts. I think actually the real practical initial early adopters of AI and machine learning are going to happen first at the city level in some respects. And then we've got to figure out where we best want to use it at the federal level. We have some questions for, from Twitter, and one is from Bob Resselman. This is a really interesting one, and he's asking about the impact of automation and AI on human employment. And I think when we, when we talk about AI, this is, and robots and autonomous systems, this is one of the big questions that comes up. So Michael, uh, what are your thoughts about that? Sure. Uh, so about a month after we published this age of analytics report uh, and about a month, one, one month ago, we published another report. And by the way, these are freely available uh, on the web, uh, which really looked at the potential for automation uh, to affect uh, the employment and the global workforce. And so a couple of things. One is um, uh, one of the things that we did in, in this research was to look at not only every occupation, because we think it's quite rare that, in fact, you'll be able to remove someone out of a job and you know, put an AI or a robot in there that will do everything that they did. We actually conduct a number of different activities in any job. So we looked at things at the level of individual activities and scored them against 18 different capabilities, which potentially could be automated. Everything from fine motor skills, map navigating the physical world, cognitive tasks such as problem solving, um, sensory uh, uh, activities, and even understanding and producing natural language. And one of the you know, highlight findings is that um, about 50% of all the activities we pay people to do in the global workforce could potentially be automated by adapting currently demonstrated technologies, which sounds scary. Um, you know, that's, you know, wow, 50% of the things that we pay people to do. But that's not going to happen overnight. Uh, and again, a part of our analysis was understanding what those time frames might be. Now, we can't predict the future. So we developed some scenarios with really wide bands around them. But when you think about the requirements, you know, I said theoretically they could, you know, 50% of these activities could be automated. Really, it takes time to integrate those capabilities technologically and create individual solutions. And then beyond that, you have to create a business case because what I didn't say was, you know, this, this would cost less than it does a person to do it. And so again, when you compare the cost to develop and deploy these technologies against the cost that people for doing, for doing the same things. And then finally, the natural curve of adoption of any technology, which often takes eight to 28 years after the time that something's commercially available to the time it reaches plateau in its eventual um, uh, you know, full adoption then it might take something like 40 years or 10 presidential terms. At least that's the middle point of all the scenarios that we uh, modeled out before 50% of current activities uh, are even automated. Now, what's interesting is that level of change in what people do is not unprecedented. If you look back in 1900, about 40% of the US workforce was involved in agriculture. And about 70 years later, about 2% was. So what that actually says to us uh, is that, in fact, we need to find new things for people to do as automation comes into play so that people are complements of the work that machines are doing. And in fact, we need that quite badly because of because of aging. We need everybody working plus the robots working to have the, to have the economic growth that we need. It's been done before. I'm a sunny Californian, so I'm hopeful this can be done. 
uh, but it will require real effort to make sure that we actually find new activities for people to do and find ways to make sure they get paid to do those new activities as machines work alongside human beings. So very clearly then, uh, this technology has the potential to drive a major social upheaval. Michael, that's essentially the implication of what you're saying. Yeah, and I think the question is, what word do you want to use? I think it shifts uh, is a different word than upheaval, which is a different word than disruption. But what we what we are saying is that all of us, because again, it's not it's not 50% of jobs. It's nearly 100% of jobs will have a significant percentage of their activities that will change. How can we all have the flexibility, have the training, have the retraining? so that we're enabled to, to do new things as we help use machines to improve our productivity. And I, I, I would like to add to what Michael is saying, because I agree, it really is about augmenting human capabilities as opposed to replacing human capabilities. We almost should be talking, instead about artificial intelligence, we should be talking about augmented intelligence. And, and as we talked about earlier, what, what machine learning and AI is really good at is are things that are pattern recognition and repetitive in nature. So in some respects, I don't know if we humans want to do those things that are repetitive, rote, that are the same thing over and over again for hours at the end of the day. What this is really doing is freeing us up to focus on those jobs that are going to be non-routine, where there is no pattern that is present, or even in fact where the machine tips and cues us and say, I've identified something that fits outside the pattern. You should pay attention to it. I don't know why it's happening. That that's going to require a human to take a look at it, but it's almost freeing us up to focus on those things that require more creativity. Now, that said, it does ask interesting questions, which is one, what skills should we be training, not just current students in school, so they can be ready for this future of working together in augmented capabilities, but also retraining existing workers so they can actually be ready for this future that is not necessarily going to be rote and repetitive work for them, but instead is going to be about what is non-routine work? What is the diagnostic work when a machine tips and cues you to pay attention to it? We really do need to look at what is the future of pairing humans plus machine working together and what does that look like and what new patterns of work will emerge as a result? And what about the uh, ethical issues of this? It's, it's so fascinating to me because we've got essentially a technology or set of technologies and techniques that very quickly uh, have cultural and social educational implications, and therefore that immediately takes us down the, uh, the ethical pathway. So what about that? So uh, go ahead, Michael. Go ahead, David. <laughs> you first, Michael. <laughs> Well, a, a couple of things. Um, you know, let, let me just build on something that David said before in terms of the need for augmentation. You know, one ethical issue to, to, to bring to bear is what is it that we'll need to make sure that the next generation actually has better lives than this generation? For the past 50 years in the biggest economies in the world, about half of the economic growth we've seen has become come about because of increases in, in employment and about half of it because of increases in productivity, the ability to use machines and, and other management innovations to do more with you know, fewer hours. Um, in the next 50 years, we're basically going to lose half of the sources of our economic growth. Why? Because countries are aging. The US is aging. China's workforce is actually decreasing in size, and that's a billion and a half people. In Japan, it's already happening. And so unless we have everybody working, plus the robots working, we simply won't have enough, enough economic growth for the next generation to have better lives than we do. And so, you know, that's an ethical question already. It actually suggests we need to accelerate the use of uh, automation. But that being said, I think, Michael, to get to your question, um, you know, as David mentioned before, we embed, and this is true not only of AI, but all technologies, we embed a lot of our values in the technologies that we develop. So, you know, lots of people talk about self-driving cars and, you know, this, this trolley problem, you know, if a car, you know, turns one way, it, it kills pedestrians. If it turns the other way, it kills the people in the car. You know, what should be done? Um, you know, these are, you know, that's, that's a you know, particularly stark and interesting, you know, philosophical discussion. But I, I, long before we start, start to need to worry about those in a real uh, deep way, because, you know, for a, to a large extent, the cars are not automating the ability, you know, the ability uh, in practice to, to do philosophy, they're, they're, you know, they're, they're incorporating algorithms about, you know, what they're quote, seeing in the road. Um, I think more importantly, as, as many of these, 
uh, technologies, particularly machine learning, which is more about training computers rather than programming them. Uh, understanding what it is, the data you have in your training set is perhaps the most important thing. And as David said, sometimes that training set is biased in terms of the data that you selected. And that's where this idea of not just using data and using analytics, but using it well is what's most important. And I come back to this thing about it's not just the data and analytics, it's about the people who use it. And that's a lot of what is goes into being a good data scientist. How do you make sure that you understand, you know, the provenance of the data, the biases that come about because you collect the data? One of the most famous ones that a lot of us who spend time in data talk about uh, is the ability to use a, a mobile device and in Boston did it in order to determine you know, where there are potholes, people drive around and the accelerometer says, you know, notices, uh, you know, a bump and says, oh, well, there, there might be a pothole there. And one of the things that at the time was true was there's a bit of a bias in that sample set based on who had smartphones at that time. And so again, needing to understand that biases come about, it's really an ethical issue about, you know, what training set you're using in order to train a machine learning algorithm. We, we have a, a couple of people on Twitter who have asked the same question or made the same comment. And I want to remind uh, folks who are watching on Facebook, if you want to have uh, be part of the discussion right now, hop over to Twitter using the hashtag CXO Talk. Uh, you can watch on, watch on Facebook and chat over on Twitter. So uh, Neil Radin, and uh, Bob Bresselman have both, both raised the comment that in this new world of job training, what kind of skills are going to be needed for people to, to be trained and to adapt? So I will, uh, I will actually sort of pull into that question what Michael just said about biases. I think it is being aware of both your biases and other people's biases and how that impacts what the machine does. I think it's something that if you're lucky, maybe you pick up either from your own childhood upbringing or from your schooling, but I don't think we currently have significant courses focused on, I don't even know necessarily what the subject would be other than critical awareness of being aware of your biases and being aware of the biases of others and how that impacts outcomes involving a machine, involving an organization. And so I think that's a new thing that doesn't exist and in some respects the machine can actually reveal to us. Uh, I also think it's, it's gonna be about cognitive offloading of certain things and being able to turn off the day. I could easily see someone getting so wrapped up with the fact that the machine doesn't have to sleep, the machine doesn't have to eat, that they end up 14 hours later still involved working with the machine and not turning things off. And so you're beginning to see that already where people are saying, you know, after about nine o'clock, 10 o'clock at night, if you email me, I'm not going to respond. I will pick it up the next morning. I think being able to cognitively offload some of your work and recognize that that machine's going to keep on working in the background and that's okay, but you as a human need to take care of yourself. That's also a skill. It's almost like how we do like physical education for kids. We may need to equally do some version of cognitive cognitive relaxation and awareness as to when do you turn off your device and that you're not 24-7. A lot of uh, a lot of uh, social questions here. We've got only about ten minutes left, and one of the topics that I really wanted to talk about is Michael speaks about the concept of radical personalization, and I think that's very important. And and so, Michael, would you share with us what to tell us about that? Well, I think one of the things that we've often discovered, um, you know, when looking at data and analytics. Um, you know, those of us who are, are, are uh, uh, like data um, is, uh, you know, we look at averages uh, and means in particular. And what we found is oftentimes the averages hide some of the most interesting insights. And so being able to understand distributions has, has always been important when it comes to data. And then, um, you know, to use a marketing term, this idea of segmentation. In fact, not every customer wants the same thing. Not every citizen wants the same thing. Not every citizen uh, is going to benefit from the same sort of intervention, uh, et cetera. And so that's one of the things that we've, we've known for many, many years. But uh, now that we have the technological capability to not only look at you know, three uh, customer segments based on demographics or 10 behavioral segments, really being able to help an individual based on what their needs are you know, from a healthcare perspective, really understand, for example, their genetic makeup, uh, and then to be able to customize something 
or an individual, a segment of one, as the people in marketing say. I think that's a capability which is now coming to the fore. Uh, and one of the things to, that we know is that um, just thinking about people as individuals is something we naturally do as human beings, but being able to have our machines do that as well uh, is where a lot of value can be created. It does bring to mind, again, coming back to your question about ethics and, and uh, values, you know, how you ought to uh, deal with the privacy question, because when you have enough information to be able to customize a service, uh, a product for a person, that means you, you do have some pretty interesting information about an individual. Uh, and so you have some questions about how you want to handle that. Uh, but assuming that you're able to understand that, handle that, provide that uh, individual citizen or customer or uh, employee um, with the understanding of why their data is being used and how, um, then we can start to you know, provide, as you described, a radical personalization. It is one of the things that we described in our report from December as being a potentially disruptive force because many organizations are set up really to deal with groups as opposed to individuals. Um, and when a competing organization comes about and says, I can provide you with exactly what you need in a very customized way that can change the game. And I think that is going to be a fascinating area for public sector to try and wrestle with, especially in republics and representative democracies. Uh, historically, the public sector has provided the same service without any personalization to everybody because we were trying to be equitable. And we don't want people to say, well, they got preferential treatment or they got something special. But I think as consumers and citizens alike become Ex almost expecting that they're going to get personalization from the private sector, and then they're gonna look at the public sector and say, why aren't you treating me like an individual? That is going to be a real thorny issue of how do we allow the public sector to do personalization of the services to you, but still have checks and balances to make sure no one's getting preferential treatment or bias treatment, um, or it may very well be that people don't wanna reveal the information necessary to give the personalization. And so that's where actually I think for public service, and it may apply to other organizations organizations as well, we almost need to take the golden rule of do unto others as you would have them do unto you and tweak it slightly for what Michael was saying to be do unto others as they will permit and maybe even like you to do unto them. And so we have to figure out how can individuals in the public express what they want permitted done to their data to a government, what they would like to have done with it and recognize that's going to have huge variability across nations and across the world. We have got a, uh, bunch of questions coming in from Twitter and we don't have that much time left but here's an interesting one from Chad Barbier I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly and he asks uh, what applications are you finding that automation is working well today anybody I'll mention a couple of quick things. Um, some of the types of activities that we found uh, are, which have the greatest automation potential are physical activities in predictable environments. Uh, and so a classic case of that is uh, an assembly line. So we're starting to see a lot of robotics being used in those types of situations. What's interesting is that as robotics decrease in cost, we're starting to see them used in services as well. So for instance, at home, I have a robotic vacuum. Uh, some people say, until we figure out the problem, we call it a robot. Afterwards, we call it dishwasher. And so I think on the physical side, that's happening. On the more cognitive side, uh, two other types of activities, collecting data and analyzing data. And many times, I think people who are watching or listening will, will be, recognize this. How many times are there systems where I have to you know, look something up on this system and type it in over here or cut and paste and copy and paste, et cetera? There are a set of uh, technologies described as robotic process automation. They're not robots. They're software robots. But they automate some of these processes, which are, as David said, these boring things where I'm just taking something from you know, this application, copying it and pasting it into this one, doing all that really rote, simple and super annoying things. Uh, we're seeing more and more organizations try to deploy those types of software robots uh, to take away that really annoying work from uh, human beings. And David, uh, your thoughts on what is working well today in terms of automation? So there actually was a competition about two years ago on Craigle to see if anyone could write an algorithm that would grade papers uh, at the, for a third grade teacher. So find the same sentence mistakes and grammar mistakes. And for about $60,000, someone actually wrote an algorithm that succeeded in doing that. And so amplifying what Michael was saying, I think it is 
my interests, particularly because I'm in public service, are what are those things that we can do to remove the rote repetitive work from individuals so they can focus on the unique problem solving things they need to do. So I think it is making sense of uh, large amounts of data to find errors, to correct things, to give recommendations back, and then to tip and cue a human to pay attention. Those are the things right now that I think are working today. Um, I think the, the, the challenge is, in a lot of cases, those systems that can make sense of patterns and can tip and cue humans don't have access to sufficient amount of data of things that are used to the public, whether it's because we need to make sure we protect privacy, maybe because that data is right now not in a format that can actually be used by the machine. I think we need to have better conversations about what are the top maybe three challenges we want to solve as a nation, and then identification of what data as well as algorithms we can bring to bear. But that technology exists today to find interesting patterns, to find things that are missing, and to make corrections. So we've got just about five minutes left. and. Uh, Michael, would you share with us your the, the kind of uh, distilled summary of your thoughts about where this is going in the in the near term and practical advice that you have for managers, business leaders who are looking at this changing landscape and feeling you know a little bit confused about what to do? A couple of just uh, quick things. Um, you know, one is uh, we talk about data a lot. And I think one of the things that we found and my colleagues who are helping uh, various organizations around the world find is that there's usually value just sitting on the table. Uh, because in most cases, organizations have access to a lot of data, whether it's data within their organizations or external or open data. And a very small percentage of the value gets captured of that data that's already sitting there. So, you know, number one, figure out what you can do with the stuff that you already have, already have access to. And then the, the second thing, which is actually the harder thing, uh, which is that because data analytics, AI, machine learning can actually add value to almost any process. The hardest thing oftentimes is prioritization. Figure out where, what you should do first. And that really just requires you to map out where you could do things and then prioritize the things that create the most value and you can capture most easily. Um, and, and then finally, the, the, the last thing I'd say is um, you've got to solve the technical problems, but the hardest problems, as we've talked about several times, are how you move an organization. And that just requires not just, it requires leadership. And so working on the leadership side to move an organization to use these technologies well uh, is what's important. And David Bray, uh, your thoughts on how do you move an organization, as Michael was just saying, how do you move an organization to be able to take advantage of these technologies in the right way? So uh, sort of looping back how 10 years ago, Michael and I were researching distributed problem solving networks. I think you need to recognize that no one person is going to know one all the data that is of value in the organization and no one person is going to know the processes that can best lean themselves to being adapted and improved. So almost in some respects, you want to crowdsource it within your organization and you want to champion saying, if anyone can come to me with an interesting pitch on the inside that says, look, if we brought this data and this data together, we'd have these insights and then we could tackle this process. And you almost treat it like an internal venture capitalist. That shifts the role of CIO from being responsible for being top down and having to supposedly know everything in a rapidly changing world to being almost at human flag jacket and champion of anyone who can bring interesting data to bear that can inform how the organization can do better and improve those processes. And I think that's required because this is changing so quickly. And at the end of the day, you are changing what people are doing. You are changing how they work and they're gonna feel threatened if they're not bought into, I'm okay with changing this process because I see the better outcome that will come as a result. And so I think that's almost an imperative for CIOs to really work closely with their chief executive officers and say, what I will do is I will effectively serve as an internal venture capitalist on the inside for how we bring data to bring process improvements, to have organizational performance improvements and work it across the entire organization as a whole. Well, clearly, uh, these new technologies, data automation, AI, machine learning, have the dual component of the, organ the, the technology and then the organizational implications. And while that's true of, of any technology that hits the enterprise, it seems the, the potential for implication seems even greater in this case. You have been watching episode number 219 
of CXO Talk. We've been speaking with David Bray, who is the CIO for the Federal Communications Commission, and Michael Chu, who is a partner at McKinsey with the McKinsey Global Institute. Gentlemen, thank you so much for taking the time today. Thank you, Michael. It has been a uh, great discussion, and I invite everybody to come back next week because we'll be doing it again with another great show. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.